Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're coming back full circle to the questions posed in Plato's Republic on the topic of justice and injustice, which was our big question in ethics. If you have not checked out the previous lectures on this topic, it is highly advisable that you do so. We've considered four ethical theories so far, utilitarianism, Kantian ethics, virtue ethics, and religious ethics. The specific reading for this lecture is the video in the link below, Dr. Jordan Peterson on political correctness and postmodernism. Seems a bit out of place, but the argument made for the problems of postmodernism is, as you'll notice, essentially the same one used to break down ethical theories. This is because the approach is not to be right, but to unpack the variety of meanings of what it would take to coherently accept an idea. Additionally, the Peterson Lecture also provides us with an interesting approach to examine the varieties of ethical claims, namely the Darwinian survival process, which then becomes our social functionality criteria. As for us, we're going to focus our lecture on the three features of evaluating metaphysical systems. The three features start with internal coherence. And here, we take the axioms of a system and the theory it has produced, and look at whether there is a contradiction that is produced. If we find a contradiction, and that contradiction cannot be resolved by reference to things like coherent structuring of the hierarchical values and the rule exception distinction, then we have a system that cannot be true. For example, if we have a theory that says that human life is an absolute value and cannot be destroyed for any reason, then the same theory cannot rationally support things like war, death penalty, or even killing in self-defense. Now, you can attempt to work your way around that. For example, in terms of self-defense, if you are being assaulted, your intention can never be to kill the other person. As soon as that were to happen, the act would become morally wrong. But, and this argument is found in St. Aquinas, if your aim is to stop the assault and you happen to kill the other person as a necessary means of stopping the assault, that is justified. How so? Well, if your aim is to stop the assault, then the moment the person attacking you stops, you are done with your defense. You would not pursue the use of violence any further. You might pursue legal options against such a person, but that's aimed at justice, not violence. So you're fighting, yes, but only ever with the aim of stopping the assault. But if you decide to kill the person, the moment they stop, your goal is not yet complete. Because your goal is to end their life. And so when they back off, you just got a chance for your own counterattack. Now this gives you something like a legitimate rule and exception differentiation for valuing human life and being able to effectively defend yourself. If you're never aiming for their death, it may come to the point that killing your assailant is the only way to stop them. And if you were to reach for those lethal means and they were to stop, then you would stop too. But if you continue because your intention is actually to kill, then you have gone overboard. Similar issues arise in questions of therapeutic abortions, procedures designed to save the life of a mother where you know the fetus will die. But the aim of such procedures is never to actually terminate the fetus. If you could find a way to preserve it, you would. Their death is an unintended side effect, even if it is an unavoidable one. The same way that the aim of a surgeon conducting a life-saving appendectomy is not to make you bleed. The bleeding will happen, no question, but that's not what they're trying to do. If they could remove your appendix without your bleeding, they would. And they don't give you the drugs to get you high, they do so so that you will be sedated, so that they can do their work without you moving, screaming, and causing further damage. If you have a system that is internally coherent, then you can move on to the next step, external coherence. Here, we see if the system actually maps onto the world in a meaningful way, and check whether, if we turn the theory into practice, it does the thing that it's supposed to do. So what we're really looking for is whether the predictions of a system seem to come true. And this is tricky because, unlike with internal coherence, the context of the world can get in the way. For example, let's say we have a theory that says that religion is the source of human misery, and therefore removing religion from society leads to a decrease in suffering. Cool. Well then, look at the societies that have removed religion. Now what happens? We can look at several officially atheistic societies. Soviet Russia, Mao's China, Cambodia, North Korea, and so forth. Did the quantity of suffering drop as a result of dropping religion? No, actually it increased. 
Now, of course, you can and should argue here that it was not just religion that was removed. There was a whole shift in all sorts of other things, and that's all correct and fine. But then, the idea that religion is the source of all suffering still took a big hit anyway. Obviously, even without religion, there's plenty of suffering, and sometimes drastically worse than in the religious version of that society. So the theory doesn't quite map onto the world. You can find similar examples everywhere. For example, the economic theory that people act out of rational self-interest proposed by Adam Smith is just false. In fact, we find that people are highly irrational in their financial decisions. For a demonstration, look around your room. Now notice all the things you have that you don't need. Those things cost money. That is, they cost hours of your life. You traded hours of your life for useless objects that have no value and no value to you. And you're certainly not alone there. A thing to note here is that there are a number of argument types around external coherence which don't work. For example, if everybody just believed this thing, then the system would work. Now this is a bad argument because it tells you nothing. Yes, if everyone agreed with you, then you would never argue with anyone because everyone agrees with you. Right? This is a tautology. It is a restating of the definition. And because you can use it for any system, including the truly broken ones, it's a bad argument. See, if everybody believed the Nazi ideology, there would have been no need for World War II. Well, duh. That's because all the countries would have freely become part of Nazi Germany, and all the undesirable people would have checked themselves in for extermination. The other kind of argument that doesn't work is a statement like, if people would just stop being so, insert bad quality here, or if they were more, insert good quality here, it would work. Now this is a bad argument because it boils down to this. If only human nature was different, then things would be different. Again, no duh. If cats were dogs, they would act like dogs, not like cats. But this doesn't tell us anything about how this world with these people operates, nor what can we make it do. Any system based on people not being people might as well be a fanfic about aliens. Finally, this also holds for asking people to be purely rational. We have emotions, and they must be accounted for. Even if your system is based on purely rational behavior, it has to at least address the whole humans have emotion thing in a very coherent way that actually resolves it. Finally, we have the third and final evaluation method for metaphysical systems, and that is social functionality. Now, when we talk about social functionality, we're really talking about whether a system can be functional, stable, dynamic, sustainable, and scalable over time. That is the definition of harmony. For social functionality, we care about those features in a social context. So we consider a kid playing a game with other kids, and the kid who loses the game badly enough will not be invited to play the game again, especially if it's a sore loser because no one wants a kid who threw a tantrum and wrecked the game to come back. So Tantrum Timmy is getting socially rejected. And that's not new, we kind of figured that because the internal and external coherence of his idea of how to play the game has failed. The other option is sore winners. The kid that wins the game, but then gloats and belittles others because he won. And so Jackass Jack is not getting invited to play any more games either. So even though Jack had a functional internal and external coherence for this game, he failed at the social functionality element. So this is the inherent part of any system. It's the idea to keep playing the game. That is, you don't want to only win right now. You want to be in a position where you can keep winning. And that means that in victory or in loss, you want to be invited to play the next game and then the game after that and then all the other games across the spectrum of human behavior. If you win now, but that means that you will not be invited to play again, what you actually have is a loss. And the way that you keep getting invited to play games is by making sure that your metaphysics have a social functionality factor that's properly built in. In terms of ethical systems, a system that only has some kind of self-benefit as its highest moral value becomes the inevitable loser and this should have been anticipated. 
the long-term ability to have the world behave as you want it to behave is ultimately dependent on others because you're not alone in the universe. And therefore, your highest moral value has to have a social benefit aspect to it or you will be rejected and kept out of society. So social functionality equals your ability to project some sort of a social benefit in your success as well as your failure. Now, this tells us that the potential functional ethical theories, functional interpretations of the world, are actually far more limited than we might have believed. In practice, bad systems are generally killed off fairly quickly. Now, some might rise to prominence for a while, but they will get killed off. The Mongols, for example, were a holy terror across two continents for over a hundred years. But then, as their ideas got exposed for not being long-term functional, the Mongols themselves integrated into societies they had occupied. So they became Muslims in the West and Chinese in the East. But we probably won't avoid the need to have those 100 years of terror just to decide if a system works or not, so that's why we use the evaluation tools. The internal coherence tells us whether a system has a potential to work. If you have an internal contradiction, the whole thing falls apart, so that's why that's a step one. The external coherence part tells us what features in application we should be looking for to see if the system actually applies to our world or not. If you have a system that does not meaningfully map onto the real world, then you have a great world for a fantasy film, but not a functional theory. And finally, the social functionality aspect tells us if this system will actually survive, if it can continue to work with the rest of the world. Going back to the idea of harmony in metaphysics, a disharmonious system will be rejected one way or another. That is, it will be killed off in a Darwinian way. If your great new idea only makes you enemies, you're getting killed off sooner or later. And that's the Nazis. They were internally coherent and externally coherent, but socially non-functional. Why? Because the idea of a racially based overlords who are, in essence, above the law, is fine if you want to keep it in your own country. And that's because everyone there is an overlord. But if you push for a global reach of that ideology, where you go out looking for people whose overlord you will be, you get everybody else to turn around and answer with a collective, no. This is also what you find in colonialism. The foreign overlords could only last while they had the momentary military advantage. As soon as the locals got their act together, often requiring that the locals stop their own infighting and actually have a shared direction of their highest moral value, the colonials were forced out. Or, if you want to be more accurate, the cost of trying to remain in power colonially simply got too high. And this is how the Afghanis have managed to oust every would-be conqueror since Alexander the Great. So, how do our ethical theories stack up against these rules for evaluation? It sort of depends on who you ask. You've noticed that every single one of our ethical theories we looked at had its problems. Now, if you ask people who advocate for these theories, they'll tell you that these and other problems are just minor hiccups that they're currently working out. Ask someone who advocates for a different theory, and they'll tell you that these are insurmountable obstacles. Part of the problem here is that few, if any, ethicists actually seem to work on these problems from a holistic perspective. That is, they focus on one issue, or maybe one set of issues, and they stay there. As a result, they tend to have a rather poor grasp on the way that the theory works as a whole, or how the idea of ethical theories through meta-ethics works across their theories. So they defend their own little piece of it, and they attack other small pieces, and the whole thing resembles nothing so much as watching a political debate. Now, at the end of every debate, people from each political camp come out and claim that their candidate was the clear winner. And this is because each side is concerned with their own theory. No one is looking at the metaphysical whole and comparing the systems in a way that is comparable, and that would be from outside of the axioms of that system. Now, authors like Nietzsche, on the other hand, are great specifically because they have such a great grasp on the whole, not just the individual pieces. For example, in our lecture on moral obligations, we raise the problem of the notion of costly moral obligations in a secular world. The issue is that if all benefits and costs are limited by death, 
then the idea of moral obligation makes no sense. Now, if you are already starting from the axiomatic assumption of a purely material world, this isn't a problem for you, it is a defining feature. Because no theory can go beyond death, since there is nothing beyond death. So, that's just your context of operations, like the fact that the speed of light is a constant. But if you have not made that axiomatic assumption, then the issue is paramount. In fact, it disqualifies all secular ethical theories out there from actually being ethical theories. They are, perhaps, theories about the general outcomes of fairly banal daily behavior of the majority of people and how that behavior can be directed when properly playing on their preferences. This does not necessarily mean that any religious theory works either, and maybe you end up in hardcore nihilism. But even in that case, you have done what the majority of people have not. You've actually examined the ideas of a theory from the outside, rather than use your set of axioms to dismiss an idea based on a different set of axioms, which is ultimately a pointless exercise. In fact, it amounts to nothing more than saying that different things are different. Your agreement or disagreement on which ethical theory is best ultimately depends on what you decide to make your own highest moral value. And that's because the kinds of crucial questions that are relevant to you will be determined by what your own axioms designate as valuable. If you're a nihilist and concerned with your own benefits alone, then the question of justice and injustice noted in the Republic is not a question you care about. If you're all about might makes right, then the suffering of the most just man and the success of the most unjust man is just the world being exactly how it should be. The real trick is to make sure that your own ideas are actually explored and that they're coherent. This is the point of those evaluation tools. That you know what you believe, no matter what it is, and that you believe it for good reasons. I take that to be the most important issue, because at least that way you actually have a chance of being something. If you claim an ethical position, but know nothing about it, then you can't be set to meaningfully believe it. A person who is all about might makes right, but who then complains that the people in power are not playing fair, has misunderstood their own position. Ultimately, reason can't tell you which ideas are good, but it can at least get rid of the bad ones. If you're left with multiple good options, any of them will do. But if you don't use reason and fully explore the ideas, your odds of getting anything right are about as good as picking a random number on the number line to answer a math question. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments or shoot me an email. Thank you.